Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Alexandre Michy, cardiologist uh, in Montluçon, France. I'm the head of the telecardiology working group from the ASFTH. The ASFTH um, represents the International Society for Telemedicine and E-Health, and it counts around 40,000 uh, medical professionals around the world. Uh, we have the pleasure today to air this very beautiful webinar, which is dedicated to um, uh, interventional cardiology. So it is called Issues in CTO-PCI. And I have the pleasure to uh, have as, as guests and as speakers uh, very important specialists in the domain. Um, without delaying further this presentation, I will uh, give uh, the word uh, to um, uh, my um, uh, co-hosts, Dr. Wakar Ahmed uh, from um, um, uh, the KSA and Dr. Jack Hall from the USA. Wakar. Thank you, Alexandru. And I would like to thank you for inviting me to do this uh, uh, CTO, put together the CTO webinar along with Mirva Talasnaj, uh, who could not join us today, um, but our best wishes. Meanwhile, I would like to introduce uh, my co-moderator, Jack Hall, who I met through Twitter, Rachel Lamy through Twitter, and Kate Kearney, who could not be with us, but I have her video. She's in some beautiful wilderness in Alaska. I'll wait to see the pictures. And one of the things this webinar shows is how Twitter has brought us together. Uh, otherwise, we probably would never have connected with each other. So I will hand over to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Hall, who is the director of CHIP CTO intervention in Parari Heart in Springfield, Illinois, um, to introduce the first speaker, Jack. Thank you, Wakar, and I'd like to thank the uh, telecardiology working group for putting together another splendid program, and I hope it's entertaining and educational, and the chance to work with all my Twitter friends is a uh, dream come true. Love working with you all, and uh, enjoy Twitter. Uh, Rasha, you're going to lead us off and uh, look into some uh, placebo effects of CTO-PCI, I think, which uh, I get to do wires, which I love. I can only assume that you love placebo. So let us start <laughs> us off and let us know what we're doing here. Thank you very much. Firstly, thanks to you all for inviting me to speak. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And I guess the first thing to say is I'm certainly no CTO expert. I've done a few CTOs in my time, but I can't prepare to be an expert. But you're quite right, Jack. One of the things that has been one of my expertises is trying to learn and understand something about the placebo effect of what we do as interventional cardiologists. I hope I'm pretty good at delivering some placebo, but I think all of us as interventional cardiologists, whether we like it or not, do deliver placebo because it's part of actually being a good doctor. So let's consider whether there's a placebo effect of CTO-PCI and if it's important to even know about it. So I think importantly, what we all need to acknowledge as, as interventional cardiologists and as doctors in general is that placebo is actually not something to be sniffed at, not something that we should be embarrassed of, but is actually a very important part of medical care. We've all heard those patients who say, look, I just feel so much better after I see you in clinic. And the reality is that's part of what we do. We reassure patients, we make them feel better. And we explain to them what's important and what they need to present to an ER with and what's not important and what we can kind of try and counsel them through. So importantly, there is a science to placebo. And we know, have known for some time that that's obviously something that we can deliver as, as, as physicians. But we know that for patients, there are all sorts of very interesting and fascinating things about placebo. So for example, red pills deliver far more placebo than white pills. Big pills deliver far more placebo than small pills. And importantly, and especially for me, who I, I remember lots of my relatives telling me they feel much more of an analgesic effect if they have an injection than if they have a tablet. So injections deliver far more placebo than pills. And importantly, surgical procedures, which is essentially what we do, deliver the most placebo of all. You can imagine what it's like to be a patient and come in and find us all gowned up and ready to go and everyone ready for them in a cath lab to be prepared for the fact that the whole team is gonna look after them and that they're for a day in the hospital. There is some placebo component to that. Importantly, even when a patient knows that they are receiving placebo, so when you tell them that they are having a placebo pill, there is some benefit to them for certain particular endpoints. So it's not that it's about an art of deception. There is something about patients, even when they understand that it's placebo that you're delivering, somehow feeling better. 
So when does it matter? Well, I would argue that placebo and, the, and, and working out that the impact of placebo only matters for subjective endpoints. So those are those endpoints that one patient will report differently to another, that physician may report differently, but importantly, even a patient themselves, depending on the time of the week, the sort of weather outside, how they're feeling, depending on the rest of their lives, will report differently. And it's these subjective endpoints that require testing with placebo control. So you're not going to need a placebo control trial if you're testing for death, um, an endpoint that's very hard to be subjective about. But you will need it for certain endpoints such as pain, quality of life, perhaps blood pressure, where you might manipulate which blood pressure reading you put uh, in the patient's notes, chest pain, weight, and, and potentially breathlessness. And there are other endpoints out there that are particularly susceptible to the way in which we report them based on what we know of our treatment. And we've seen this before in cardiology. We know the story from renal denova denovation for hypertension. We all remember the excitement in when we saw the unblinded effect size of renal denovation. We all remember the billions of dollars that were put into renal denovation therapies throughout the world based on an effect size that was based on unblinded trials and a reduction in blood pressure based on these unblinded data sets. And the first blinded trial, Simplicity HDM3, really shocked the world when we suddenly saw that the blinded effect size for renal denovation was really equivalent to placebo, or at least not statistically significant. Now, we know that there are caveats that trial and limitations and of course since then there have been other blinded trials that have shown a larger effect size depending on the patients you choose and the kind of denovation you perform but ultimately what we've really seen is that blinded effect sizes for these subjected endpoints are usually much smaller than their unblinded counterparts and I guess this is where my work has come in and that's really been on the effectiveness of PCI for stable angina. So again, what we saw from unblinded trials of single vessel coronary artery by, um, uh, angioplasty in the context of the, the balloon angioplasty era before we had stents, what we saw there was a very large effect size in terms of symptom relief and exercise test at time improvement, a 96 second difference in the first of these trials to assess this, um, the ACNE trial. And we tried to replicate that in our, in our centre and across the UK by performing the first placebo control trial of angioplasty versus, um, versus placebo. And what we saw was actually that the blinded effect size on exercise time was far smaller than we expected. And in fact, the difference between the two groups was not statistically significant. And there was all sorts of fallout. And of course, we can discuss the limitations of the orbiter trial. But again, importantly, what we saw was that the blinded effect size of what we do is much smaller than the unblinded effect size. So why is that? Well, I think we need to think about the therapeutic efficacy of any therapy on a subjective clinical endpoint. So imagine the therapeutic efficacy to be this big blue box. And that blue box can be as big as you like it to be. But ultimately, for anything that's subjective, part of that blue box will be placebo, and part will be the fit, true physical effect of what we've done. And for the uh, just for simplicity, I've made that 50-50 today. You can imagine for a patient, all they actually care about is the size of the blue box. They want to feel better. So how could we increase the therapeutic efficacy? Well, we might increase it by increasing the physical effect of what we do. And in order to do that, we might select therapies that are particularly effective, um, maybe try and select the patients who are most likely to benefit and therefore really get the most bang for our buck. We might also do try and increase the placebo component. So of course, part of that will be physician patient interaction, trying to really counsel them as to what we're going to do. Importantly, building an expectation of procedural efficacy. So the more we tell them that this is gonna work, the more likely it is that they're going to have benefit. To reassure the patient that this is likely to work and then perhaps to tell them that the symptoms that they have later are unlikely to be due to the, to the, um, to the, to the condition that they came in with to tell them that the problem is fixed. And that's something that I certainly do in the cath lab now. I show them the screens, I show them how much better their artery looks. And I find that that increases their pain relief. And importantly, we can really maximize that placebo component by performing unblinded clinical trials. So let's think about the unblinded data from CTO PCI. Well, there's lots of data out there and I've just focused on a few today. So the first really comes from the open CTO trial. 
where importantly, what we know from PCI and CTO procedures is, that is the vast majority of these procedures are performed for a subjective endpoint for symptom relief. We know from the data that's out there that actually the prognostic benefit for a CTO is really still out there for question. So predominantly across the world, more than 70% of these procedures are really being performed for symptom relief. And the appropriate use criteria will tell us that that's appropriate for these patients. We can see that there really is symptom improvement in unblinded clinical trials. And in the open CTO trial, what they showed was symptom improvement at one month in terms of angina frequency, physical limitation, quality of life and summary, uh, and, and the overall SAC summary score at one month when, when they compared medical therapy control group versus a PCI, a PCI arm in an unblinded clinical trial. Importantly, this was also the same for quality of life scores and also for, for um, breathlessness scores. And so again, all of these metrics improved at one month. From the Euro CTO trial, where we had 396 patients that were actually randomized, not just registry data. And um, again, they showed patient reported symptom improvement at, at this time at 12 months. And actually they argued that this was, this was perhaps less likely to suspect, be susceptible to placebo because the effect of PCI had lasted far longer than those initial few weeks when you imagine that the placebo effect is at its greatest. And again, what they found was on various metrics of the SAT questionnaire, they found an improvement in symptoms in patients who'd had PCI. Importantly, even when the physician assessed symptoms using CCS, again, there was an improvement and a greater improvement in the PCI on patients than in the OMT patients. But importantly, even those medical therapy patients did have some improvement. And that makes you start to wonder what all of this improvement is. And is it possible that even just being part of a clinical trial and having lots of people look after you and think about your symptoms makes you start to get better over time? So how about, is there any data out there that shows us that there might be an evidence of a placebo effect? Well, actually, if you look at the data, there is some interesting data out there. And again, when we go back to that open CTO trial, which is, of course, registry data of over a thousand patients, what is interesting and what makes me start to think about the placebo effect of PCI and CTO procedures is that what we can see from the data that even in failed CTO PCI, there is some improvement in symptoms and it's a significant improvement in symptoms. Have a look at those bars on the right. You can see that even when we're unsuccessful at opening the artery, more patients report that they feel better and that their symptoms have improved. So what's that about? Why are they feeling better even when we haven't improved the blood supply to the heart? Could that, this be partly due to placebo? So now I'm going to kind of wrap up to kind of think about what's next. So I think it's probably time for a placebo controlled trial of CTO PCI. And guess what? We're trying to design one here in the UK. And I know that some of the CTO operators will start to shake in their boots, but we are interventional cardiologists and we're just trying to work out whether there's a, a true physical effect of what we do. And more importantly, I'm sure there is that physical effect, but how large is that physical effect? So of course, when you think about designing a placebo control trial for CTO PCI, that's complex. It's much harder than designing the orbiter style, single vessel, more simple coronary angioplasty trial. There is lots of difficulties in trying to make sure that we blind patients and importantly, the medical teams outside to long procedures. These CTO procedures can take three hours. How do you keep a patient on a cath lab table, asleep having a placebo procedure for that time? But importantly, how do you make sure that they, when they go outside, they have no idea whether they were there for three hours or half an hour? And there's all sorts of complexity to that. And we're, we're kind of dealing with that at the moment in designing the trial. It's also really important to think about site selection because of course you want to make sure that you have high success rates. And you want to make sure that you select um, individuals who will put all of their CTOs or the, or the vast majority of their CTOs into this trial and that we won't just select easy ones, that we will try and make sure that we have decent patient selection that's comprehensive and that the sites try and include as many patients as possible. It's also important to think about the ethics of this because, of course, there are some extra risks. We need to make sure that both arms of the trial have, have the same access points. And of course, with CTO PCI, that means dual access in all. And so for some people having placebo procedure, they have double the risk of, a, of an access complication without any of the benefits. 
There's obviously also potentially some selection bias in the kind of CTOs we put in. And of course, that's really important in terms of designing the trial. And there's funding issues because this trial will be expensive and not very many uh, device companies out there are willing to fund trials like this. So we're not the first to think about this. In fact, uh, the Shine CTO trial was probably the first designed placebo control trial um, in, in CTOs. Unfortunately, due to funding issues and because of COVID and because it's very hard to design and recruit for these trials, the trial has been suspended. We have now just literally hot off the press got ethics for Orbiter CTO. Now, actually, we're starting with a pilot trial and we're going to hopefully build to the larger trial, but we're taking a population of, of patients with single vessel CTO. And this trial, importantly, has been designed predominantly, actually, by the interventional cardiologist, Dr. Keeble and Dr. Davies and actually Dr. Khan over at the Essex Cardiothoracic Centre with our support from Imperial College London. And it's a kind of collaborative effort. And we're taking patients who have single vessel CTO, who have symptoms uh, due to their CTO and, and who have evidence of ischemia and viability in that CTO territory. They're gonna be on real world antianginal therapy. And importantly, the intervention will be CTO PCI with um, drug eluting stents and the control arm will be a placebo procedure. So much like Orbiter, these patients will be sedated. They'll be listening to music via headphones and they'll have no idea what they had done. The outcome will be daily symptom frequency on a symptom app. And actually the follow-up time can be quite long. It's gonna be six months because of course we know that these patients are stable. We're gonna see the results of this pilot data and hopefully on the basis of that, design the much bigger trial that we hope will be across the UK and that we'll report shortly. So I will um, stop talking there and I hope I've convinced you that it's worth looking into placebo, the placebo effect of what we do um, in interventional cardiology. And importantly, I think in CTO PCI, it must exist. The question is really how big is that effect and does it even matter? And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Rasha. Uh, yes, we will have an open discussion uh, at the end of the three presentations. Um, so I would uh, thank you, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was very beautiful. Um, uh, I will give uh, uh, right away the work to Jack Hall. I would like also to mention that this program is, um, is um, supported by Boston Scientific. And also we would uh, like to, to salute uh, Mirvat, um, all the four of us. Um, she uh, wasn't able to join us. So uh, I would like to present um, our colleague, Dr. Jack Hall, uh, which is, uh, he is the director of uh, the CTO intervention at Prairie Heart and the uh, director of the interventional cardiology um, department at HSHS, St. Mary's, Springfield, Illinois, Illinois uh, United States. I hope I got it right, Jack. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, no problems. Okay. You have the word, you can share your, your screen, please. Great, we can see it. Excellent. I thank you for the introduction and Rasha, that was a marvelous review of uh, raising the questions we all have, not only the patients who go undergo these procedures, but the, the physicians who uh, struggle with getting these procedures done. After you fail your placebos of chronic nitrates and renolazine, uh, then we move right up the ladder to the placebo effect of CTO-PCI. It will be anxious to see what Orbit a CTO brings out and uh, uh, wish you well in enrolling and getting this off the ground. So good luck with that. Uh, we're going to go down more to the tools uh, uh, that I use to get my CTO PCI procedures done. Uh, I have a huge interest in, in wires. Wires make our procedures successful, make them more efficient, and hopefully I'll be able to share some of those tips and tricks today. which would be nice if they would scroll through. Try and use the arrows maybe. There we go. There are my contacts. I, uh, as Wakar pointed out, uh, I, I am a frequent visitor of Twitter and learn a lot from Twitter. So please uh, join me there. 
uh, or for specific questions, I can be reached at that email. Historically, uh, PCI and PTCA was performed with fixed wire systems. Uh, the wire was fixed to the balloon, a la Andreas Grunzig, and then we moved beyond that. We developed a separate balloon with a separate wire for the procedure. And initially, the only wire we had was the high torque floppy wire, which we used uh, in 100% of cases and enjoyed that. And then we quickly uh, added in the intermediate wire and standard wires for CTO PCI. Uh, these were crude, they weren't uh, very eloquent, uh, but we got, we got the job done in a certain percentage of cases. But in today's world, we have a myriad of choices of wires to help us. And we've gotten so many wires, we're now starting to classify them or we'll put them into loose classes to help us compare and know when to use which wire, and we'll be talking about that today. Understanding the basic wire construction will be the key to really understanding the wire. You'll understand why the wire performs this way or that way, the attributes of the wire that will help you achieve your goals with that lesion at that time. And you'll also understand the weaknesses of the wire which may create a hurdle downstream. A wire is not very useful if it crosses, only to find out that you cannot deliver any equipment behind it. Uh, so knowing the wire's strengths and its weaknesses will help you during a procedure. And then as you get more comfortable with the difference of wires, you'll be able to compare new wires that the engineers and other smart people are designing today and will bring to your labs tomorrow. You have to have a strong foundation in order to tease out the marketing effects from the real effects and understanding the wire construction, I think is really important for the uh, new operators and certainly important for all CTO operators. These are the key elements to guide wire constructions. I'm not going to go deeply into this. Uh, it's something that I enjoy and James Spratt enjoys, but I think that we might be the only two on the planet that enjoy this. But the core material of the wire, stainless steel versus nitinol, the coils, the number of coils and the coverings and the end of the wire, the coatings of the wire, meaning a plastic jacket or no plastic jacket, the tip, does it have a shaping ribbon, does it go to cord a tip, uh, and then your taper, does the wire go 014 the length of it or does it taper down uh, to uh, eight thousandths of an inch or nine thousandths of an inch. All these variables combined in different degrees and different wires give each wire a specific feel, a specific use, a specific uh, detriment uh, in some cases. So knowing what the uh, different elements are and how the wires are put together will help you choose a wire for your specific case. Here are the loose wire classifications that we talk about on Twitter and talk about in our CTO courses. There's the workhorse wires, the collateral crossing wires, jacketed wires, your penetration wires, support wires, and externalization wires. The important thing to know as you do CTOs is to be comfortable with one or two wires in each of these classes. Nowadays, there will be a multitude of wires in each of these classes, you do not need to know every wire. You need one or two from each of these classes and feel very comfortable with that wire in that class and be able to use that 90% of the time. And that's going to get you through all of your procedures and get you through uh, safely and hopefully successfully. We'll start with the workhorse wires. The purpose of the workhorse wire is to get you to the proximal cap of your CTO and then deliver a microcatheter to the proximal cap. The workhorse wire is really not designed to cross uh, the CTO. It's uh, uh, many times you'll get in and it'll accidentally cross. I did that once in a live course. Uh, we had uh, about 45 minutes uh, devoted to the CTO. As I advanced the workhorse wire in, it crossed the CTO and the case was over in about 10 minutes. Um, and we quickly moved on to another case. But the workhorse wire typically will not cross your CTO. It is to help deliver your equipment down to that proximal cap to begin your procedure. 
there are a multitude of examples. We all have our favorite workhorse wire. Uh, and there you see many different choices that are available in the market right now. These uh, is a chart of the penetration power uh, of workhorse wires. You see uh, the wires on the left and the penetration powers, which is grams per square millimeter on the right. You can think of this as stiffness, because uh, as you go up in penetration power, the wires are certainly more stiff. There are other variables uh, that get factored into making this calculation. But suffice it to say, a workhorse wire is going to be fairly soft, fairly safe, fairly uh, atraumatic uh, for its use. And the um, tip load or penetration powers or penetration powers are going to be between uh, 5 and 12, as this graph shows. The collateral wires, the purpose of the collateral wires are to safely na navigate your collaterals. Uh, some examples are the Fielder FC, the Xi'an, Xi'an Blue, Samurai, Samurai RC, and the Suo 03. Uh, they all have some different uh, characteristics among them. And it's really more touchy-feely in what you like and what you're seeing in your CTO. Uh, to choose which uh, collateral wire you like. And once again, you see they're all fairly soft wires. Some of them, like the Samurais, are also workhorse wires. You see here, importantly, the SUO3 is the softest uh, of any of these wires. It, the penetration power is only three grams per square millimeter. This is a wire that we use for the epicardial collaterals because it is very atraumatic. It is very difficult to perforate and lift plaques with this very soft wire. But its downside is sometimes you'll get this wire through the collaterals, but it does not have enough support to be able to deliver other gear, such as a microcatheter across the collaterals. So again, you're balancing the pros and cons and trying to choose the right wire at the right time. Uh, but we use a lot of SUO3s in the epicardials and then use a variety of the other wires for crossing our septals uh, and to come around down vein grafts. So that's just an example of some of the penetrate, uh, some of the crossing wires in that class. Jacketed wires is the next class. Jacketed wires are really important in CTO PCI. Uh, everyone has two or three of these in their bag that they enjoy using during cases. And the purpose is to overcome specific uh, barriers during a PCI case, be that you're navigating the subminimal space with a knuckle, you have lots of tortuosity or calcification in the vessel, uh, and it's the lubriciousness or slipperiness of the wire that reduces the friction uh, that allows it to go where simple stainless steel wires or nitinol wires with hydrophilic coatings aren't quite as lubricious. Uh, the examples are the fighter pilot, uh, choice whisper fielder, Xi'an Black, and the Mongo wire, which uh, was left off this slide, but also the Mongo are all jacketed wires. And here's the penetration power. You see a wide variety of penetration power. So uh, you see the Xi'an Black and Fielder FC with penetration power of eight. They're fairly soft wires. We also use these wires in just regular PCI for tortuous vessels and calcium calcified vessels. But when we get up into the CTO world, we use more of the Fielder XTs, uh, the Pilot 200s, uh, and the fighter wires, uh, and then the Mongo wire. Uh, which is fits in about 30 grams per square millimeter is uh, what we use for many of our knuckling cases. And here's the Mongo wire in the updated slide uh, showing 30 grams per square millimeter as comparison to the other jacketed wires. Penetration wires. This has really been another area that has blossomed over the last 10 years of giving us uh, different uh, penetration powers on the wires, going up to some wires that are really very stiff and make all of us nervous and using, but sometimes we need it. The purpose of these penetration power uh, wires are to puncture that fibrotic calcified proximal cap or occasionally the distal cap 
uh, the importance of these wires is once you use it for that job, once you puncture that gap with these stiff traumatic wires, once you get a microcatheter to follow it, you should de-escalate your wire and go back to a softer wire that'll increase your safety factor and avoid the perforations. So remember to use the right wire for the right lesion at the right time. These penetration wires are used to puncture the calcified fibrotic uh, caps, either proximal or distal cap. We look at Confianza Pros, the Hornets, Judos, the Estados, uh, and Miracle Bros. Here's a comparison of the penetration powers of those different wires. Uh, we use a lot of CP12, the Confianza Pro 12, and the penetration uh, power is 292. Again, I want to reference your workhorse wires are going to be 8 to 10 uh, grams per square millimeter. These are 292 grams per square millimeter. These are much stiffer wires, much more likely to penetrate uh, not only the cap, but the vessel wall and find the pericardium. Uh, we use a lot of Hornet 14s as well as the CP12 and then the Estado 20 is uh, really the monster of the penetration wire. And you see the penetration power is 617. Uh, so really you need to jump up, but understanding these different penetration powers will allow you to choose your penetration wire. If the Hornet 14 did not cross, trying a Miracle 12 or a CP12 or Hornet 10 is unlikely to do the job if the problem is the calcification and the fibrotic plaque. You need to go to a stiffer wire with higher penetration power, such as the Estado. Support wires have uh, been around. This is, we have not seen a explosion of different wires in the world uh, from the support standpoint. They are, once you get your wire and gear across, it's then to facilitate your balloons and stent uh, and other equipment to get down there. The uh, uh, IVL shockwave balloons, oftentimes in the CTO world, we need a more supportive wire to get that into the CTO segment and to utilize it to break up the calcium. But examples of the support wire are the Grand Slam, which is minimally supportive, the Mailman and Iron Man, which are very supportive. And then the wire I love is the Wiggle wire. Uh, has a lot of unique uh, aspects to it and uh, is our go-to wire once we have a difficult CTO that we've crossed and we want to take the wire variable out of our equation. We put a wiggle wire down. We know we have the most support that we could possibly get out of the wire. We put it down, we leave it there, and I never have to think about it again. It's like finding the right guide catheter that provides your coaxial support. You want to get that at the beginning of the case such that you don't have to worry about the guide catheter ever again throughout the case. Once I get my wiggle wire down, I have taken another variable out of the equation, and now I can focus on my balloon, my IVIS or OCT, and then my stenting procedure to get a good outcome on the patient. So uh, those are the support wires that we use a lot of uh, and why we use them. Lastly are the external externalization wires. Uh, and these wires all have one component that makes them useful for externalization. They're all long wires. Uh, the R350 is obviously 350 long. Uh, these are all long wires because we are going to be inserting that uh, from, let's say, the right radial approach. It's going to go through the heart anatomy and come out the left radial approach or right groin to left groin or right radial to right groin whatever, we need a long wire that's going to allow us to diverse the anatomy through our microcatheters uh, and come out long. So there's no real strong uh, difference in these wires or some minor uh, issues. The rotofloppy is not very supportive. We use a lot of R350s. Uh, this would be an area that the companies, if they can figure out how to improve the externalization wires in different ways, we'll be able to market to us and hopefully get us to pay more money for them. But right now, the key with externalization wires is length, length, and length. And these are all uh, very useful wires that we use. Conclusions for this uh, short wireology talk. 
is that you need to simplify your wire toolkit. You need one or two wires in each of those classes that you are 100% comfortable with. You need to know the properties or feel of each of those wires. You need to know their strengths, their uh, weaknesses, their advantages, what you're trying to do with that wire and why you're using it. And then uh, the more you use them, the more feel you have. And what Tony Demartini told me, the quickest way to make a case longer is to take a shortcut. Uh, so if you're trying to cross a lesion and you say, I wonder if this is the right wire, it's probably not the right wire. Stop, take your time, switch it out, get the right wire that will improve your efficacy of getting the lesion done. And it'll also increase your safety. Uh, and then what I tell all my fellows is you got to do, use the right wire for the right job uh, and be very specific. Know why you're using each different wire at each different step in the case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. That was a wonderful talk on wires. And now the last aspect of CTO PCI when we were putting together, we thought would be the complications because that is what really uh, makes us stop and think. And a lot of people who do uh, not support CTO PCI is because of the complications. And I'm uh, grateful to Kate Kearney from University of Washington, Seattle to agree to present, but she's on vacation and she could not have a good internet connection. So she sent us uh, her presentation and recording, which I'm gonna share with you and we will start. I'll pretend my connection is just not gonna be good enough at the time of the actual conference, but I'm really honored to be joining you virtually uh, to discuss preparing for complications in CTO PCI. I hear my disclosures, although none are really relevant to this talk, um, but there are some things that are relevant related to the rules that we have posted in our chat lab. So these are from Bill Lombardi. As you can see here, he's exemplifying our first rule, but ain't fun and ain't fun. Uh, but the others tend to apply more to just the mindset and our preparation for complications. You know, as we're trying to really push the envelope in terms of technical strategies and accomplishing for patients with a solid indication for PCI, um, I think it's important to remember that when we're looking at rule three here, chance favors the prepared mind, meaning that you know, if we really prepare for these cases, we think of all the potential struggles or issues or potential complications we can have as part of our angiographic review and preparing for the case. Um, you know, one, more likely to get lucky, but two, I think, you know, we're more able to avoid um, pretty catastrophic situations where um, that applies to rule four here if we're discussing that we want to use our superior judgment so you don't have to show your superior skill and avoid getting into some nasty situations if at all possible. Um, but stuff does happen when you're attempting CTO PCI. And so as we know um, from open CTO data, you know, I rely on heavily because it's core lab adjudicated and it's consecutive patients that were matched with NCBR. So we know that this really reflects um, you know, uh, high complexity of cases but is probably the most true representation and the clinical preparation rate was about 5%. So we're gonna spend a lot of our time talking about that, but some of these challenges and risks um, you know, can be anticipated and thus avoided and many of the situations I think we can learn from, whereas others are just going to happen. And so regardless of how good you are, you need to be prepared for them if we're gonna attempt these cases. Um, I just wanna make one point about Antigrade versus retrograde CTO techniques because I think we all tend to have a false sense of security that antigrade wire escalation is safe. Um, but actually, that can get you to a lot of trouble if we're dealing with ambiguity and some other things we'll talk about. So, well, retrograde CTO PCI has historically been reported to have you know three times the risk of MACE. A lot of those cases, if we look at open CTO, when we looked at the core lab adjudicated reviews, antigrade techniques cause the preparation and then to try to manage that case retrograde was the alternative strategy chosen. And so about 60% of those with both uh, retrograde and integrated techniques used where the preparation was actually due to integrated approaches. So I think you just need to be careful with integrate, especially when we're dealing with ambiguity. So your core visibility here in this picture on the right, you know, that's when we really have to be careful because if the wire just goes, something you're not really expecting to, it may be too good to be true, and you may see a jack the wire at the end of a small branch now that it's a wire curve just to start. So we have a track that's hard to avoid now. Um, but in general, jack the wires are safer unless we really follow them further out. So we're using different views and other clues. 
increase on our fluoroscopy or retrograde infections to guide us more so that we're not trying to get out too far. Um, next is when we're dealing with ambiguity, we want to de-escalate as quickly as possible. So if we cross the proximal cap with a certain penetrative wire, you may only follow that one or two millimeters, um, but really to make sure that that's okay. Because a wire perforation alone is going to be okay, but if we follow that with a microfactor or a balloon, obviously that can be um, much bigger. Uh, cause of bleeding. And then finally, um, with all cases, but especially when we're bringing gear in and out in a grave, it's when it's very likely to happen that we can set up for air embolism by trapping our gear in and out. Um, so sometimes it's best just to take the syringe off to avoid confusion if you're working with a tech that might get confused, which guide is which, etc. Um, or certainly we've all done it as well. Um, a couple of things to consider when retrograde, you know, retrograde guide based section could be really catastrophic if you're dealing with something of left in particular, or obviously. These patients have some of the same work in the baseline and it makes them vulnerable to further risking insult. So, um, using a safety wire, I think, is just good practice. And really, when we're working retrograde, the time to be extraordinarily careful is when we're pulling our retrograde micro catheter back, because that pulling um, can really suck the guide in. So, you just have to watch that. And that's where it's good to have a partner at the table um, that can help you manage that. Uh, reverse part is another unique situation if you're in an unprotected left vein. You can get excited, looks like that you've crossed and you're into the guide. and you're ready to go, but you need to make sure that you're true women before, uh, before you're crossing into the left knee in there. So that's where the technique of using a guide extension in the target vessel when possible is really helpful. But if you're dealing with an ASCA situation or single axis for whatever reason, um, you need to use IVIS or et cetera to really be sure where you are um, to make sure that you don't cause a left knee dissection there. Another thing that comes up more frequently in retrograde cases, but kind of any of these, is gear entrapment. You're working on a different part of the gear if you're very far retrograde, but really anytime with these uh, nasty calcified vessels, you might get microcatheter tips, balloon fragments, laser tips, et cetera, wires. Um, you know, that's a whole talking to itself because each piece of gear is a little bit different. Uh, but this is from a complications paper by Dick Dole and Kat CCI from our complications course now looking at these things. And in general, you're going to decide if this is something you want to go back and snag, um, or if it's still, if the hypotubing is still intact with the gear, you can advance a guide extension over that, and do whatever you can to decrease the friction there, and then pull together as a unit. Um, if you're going to go back and snag it, then this is when it's good to have you know, some familiarity with snaggers and other things in your labs. Um, or if you can get a wire past that and just exclude that by sinting into a vessel wall, um, or drag that back, etc. So there's plenty of times where we might actually leave that uh, where it is because the risk of dragging it back into a less good spot um, is actually higher risk than just abandoning it in a distal vessel. Of course, um, in certain situations, surgery might actually be indicated. So I want to spend the rest of our time talking about perforations. Um, this is a 67-year-old woman who had refractory angina, RCACTO with corresponding ischemia. Um, so we get a knuckle wire going. You're using blunt dissection tools here whenever possible because that's safer. Um, and, you know, basically we, we did ADR here in the distal vessel and that's all going well, but after we stent in and post dilated, she has this blow up perforation. Um, this is actually during a live case of all things, but this is an unfortunately nice example of a double density sign here um, where we've got contrast and you can see the outline in the REO view. So in these cases, we're obviously going to have to treat that. And so we're moving very quickly to first stabilize the bleeding. So get your balloon up. We have a wire across and you know, there's bleeding, so put pressure on it. Um, sometimes if that's not the case, you know, this is a bad time to pull the gear on accident or make that second mistake. So it's worth taking your time in that one moment, um, but you may need to proceed to ACLS measures and emergent pericardiocentesis. Unfortunately, in this case, we were able um, to get that balloon up and stabilize and get ready to place a covered stem. So it's worth knowing the details of what you carry on your shelf. You know, the graph master is older, but still a lot of labs have um, the key differences are that your covered portion may be up to 1.6 millimeters from the stent edge, and you're going to get more foreshortening as you dilate and post dilate those up, although they are fairly expandable, and that's often needed to get a good seal. Uh, the crossing profile is also higher, so you, they are six French compatible up to a four millimeter stent, um, but that you know, precludes the use of a six French guide extension. So, depending on your guide in, um, sometimes people will confirm for this reason just to upsize and get an eight French. Um, access in the groin and needed a second guide up to actually deploy the graph here. Um, when dealing with the papyrus stents, you know, they are more deliverable and they're five French compatible up to four oh six French beyond that. Um, so they're they work well with the guide extension that you may be able to deliver more easily. So we have seen some cases for stent dislodgement. So as you're loading those in the guide extension or delivering into a torturous vessel, 
calcification, et cetera. You just want to be sure that we're watching that closely to make sure it's still on the balloon. Um, so again, just good to know what you have on your shelf and kind of what the lengths are, et cetera. In general, longer is better to make sure you like cover the hole and post dilations often necessary. Um, but in these you know, cases, perforation management really takes the whole team. So you want to run drills um, with your team if this is not something you've experienced a lot. You know, you want to know how long it takes for your uh, perforation, excuse me, your perforation to straight to get there. You want to know what's stocked in terms of your covered stents and coils. You know, have no idea and you're figuring out in the moment. Um, that's how this is a lot more hectic. And finally, I think just practicing good communication between your staff really helps in these situations. So close with communication. Um, the staff feel you know, able to offer insight and give, give feedback and different things here because whatever your weaknesses or strengths are will certainly be unmasked further in these times of stress. Um, slightly different cases with distal wire perforations or epicardial. So I think any time that you're considering uh, entering an epicardial collateral, you really need to be sure that you have thought through how you can manage that. Um, and these are best to do. You've already got very comfortable with retrograde like technique or, or have someone to help you. Um, so in this case, uh, for the circumflex CTO guy with refractory angina, we failed integrated wire escalation. So come take a look at this epicardial collateral. Not the best, not the worst looking one. Um, but when entering into it, we take that pretty seriously because we know epicardial collateral perforations are high risk again from the open CTO data. About half of all of those were clinically significant, and half actually resulted in a um, in hospital death. So, you know, many epicardial collaterals will be crossed successfully without, but we take those perforations very seriously. So, in this case, um, the gentleman did have a small perforation there. You know, they had the, the collateral or both advancing the microcatheter. So, we don't have actually capture this because we just knew that had happened, took a little puff, um, injected fat via the microcatheter. So, that's free, harvested from the patient, and really accessible. Um, and then gave echo contrast given in the guide to, uh, just to be sure that we can see an extravasation of the pericardium. And then after all of the gear is removed, administered probamine. So I think this can be a tool that we've got more comfortable using, but just really important to remember that that shouldn't be given after all the gear is removed um, because of that versus risk. Um, and in general, if patients are on DAP, we've had good luck with that. Uh, he came back to lab because he's still having some chest pains, probably pericardial. Um, so we we'll to get him discharged back home to Idaho. She brought him back to the cath lab five days later and that had all sealed well. So one of the advantages of that is you can basically come back another time and still potentially reuse that site. So when thinking about collateral perforation management, you want to be sure before we enter in, you know, do you have a strategy to safely balloon across the inflow if you're not able to access the, the vessel itself? Um, negative aspiration via the microcatheter from both sides if you've already flipped externalized um, can actually be very helpful. Just that negative pressure can provide some tamponade and we can make preparations while doing so to prepare for distal embolization. But, you know, working quickly in these cases, if you can't very readily exclude it with ballooning across the inflow vessel um, is really important. And again, probably only after gear is removed, so somewhat different strategy. Um, so it's, it's important to know what your options are in your cath lab. You know, a bunch of different techniques are described. People have used thrombin, um, beads or particles. They all have their advantages or disadvantages. I think it's important with these things that you're injecting through a microcatheter to be sure that you're not fistulizing to the ventricle because we don't want to be squirting thrombin in that way. Um, but, you know, if it is a true uh, pericardial perforation, we want to uh, be prepared to coil those. Um, or if that, again, can be uh, better to work through on the, the next time. So to wrap things up, I just you know would really emphasize being prepared to manage perforations because these are the most common and the, the most um, and the biggest discrepancy relative to regular PCI that you've already become comfortable with. It's important to remember to evaluate the patient. Sometimes they look pretty bad, but they're actually fistulized. And so before we drop a bunch of covered stents that are unnecessary, et cetera, you know, taking one extra quick look at the angiogram after you have the balloon up, if the patient's tolerating that well, you know, we take advantage of the fact that. Um, patients with CTOs have preconditioning, so they can usually tolerate that balloon being up while you sort out what the next best step is. Um, finally, I think working on team dynamics, every case is really important because, you know, I know when I'm working retrograde, I, there's a lot of things going on. I might not always have my eye on the pressure as well as my team can to help with, the, with that and monitoring for different safety concerns with that. So bringing them in um, certainly helps us do a safer job, I think. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Wakar. Uh, so if you can activate your camera. camera. Yeah. Uh, great presentation. Um, yeah.
I, I would ask maybe maybe to to continue um, um, to to continue um, uh, this uh, very beautiful presentation on uh, complications. Um, so maybe maybe all of you can uh, uh, maybe can uh, would you uh, would you be able to highlight maybe uh, what should we be very careful to regarding complications during this very sophisticated procedure um, what what should be you know uh, the, 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 the can, can you make like uh, the, the top three complications that we, we, we should watch out for during these complications and maybe how uh, to avoid them Jack Jack yeah I think we can start off with some of the simpler complications that you can avoid. One is radiation safety. Uh, it's still something we stress. It's something that you need to take very seriously. Uh, delivering five grays to someone's skin it can have a terrible outcome. So uh, lowering your frames per second, using 10 inch or larger, we've now shifted that all our diagnostic cases, all our routine PCI, STEMI included, we're using on our 10 inch higher field of view and certainly do our all our CTOs on that. So we have adopted some of our radiation saving uh, strategies, not only from our CTO world, but we've moved it into all our PCI procedures and CAP procedures. Uh, and that is something that everyone should do. Proper shielding, proper screens, anything you can do to avoid uh, excess radiation, not only to the patient, but to you and your team is important. Uh, Kate did a great job on perforations. The thing about CTO PCI, you must expect perforations. You, you're going to have them. If you're doing CTO PCI, you are going to have complications. You're going to have perforations and you must be prepared for them. And Kate also pointed out and hammered home the team. She talked about the team and talk to your team. And that's really important. There are so many things going on in the screen. You'll have two guide catheters, three micro catheters, maybe four wires in. You've got a lot of moving parts. And even though I've been doing this for a decade, you can't keep your eye on all those balls. You've got a lot of balls in the air. You've got to have a trained team that's there with you. As we tell our, all our new cath lab trainees, it is everyone's responsibility to watch rhythm, pressure, and ST segments. So even if you don't know what's going on on my screen, at least be looking at the vitals and the ST segments. That might be the first clue that I've gotten into a, a problem and somebody has to speak up because I might be looking at both guides, the wires, the balloons, the lesions, and I de developed a blind spot. So uh, that would be my uh, rough summary on complications. Wakar? I think uh, Jack and Kate uh, touched up, uh, touched on everything. The important things is uh, my, I would like to emphasize uh, getting proper consent from patients. Uh, I have worked in hospitals. In my primary hospital, we take our consents ourselves. And I explain to the patients that this is a extra high risk procedure. And I quote the numbers that are in the open CTO uh, uh, registry, even though they're done by people far more experienced than I am, uh, I do quote them those numbers. And my complication rate may be even higher than they are. And I have patients who have actually said, we feel fine. We really don't want this higher risk procedure for the amount of pain we, uh, I have. And I've had two patients who've just said, no, we're fine. Uh, we'll continue in medical therapy. So uh, yeah, we. Uh, so I think the consent part is very important. I've seen hospitals where they just give uh, a, a resident, shoves a paper to the patients like sign, it's for a stent, and they don't realize that this is a much more uh, involved uh, procedure. So that's my main uh, point I would like to emphasize. Maybe also emphasize, uh, I fully agree with you, also the, the indication for the CTO. I think it's, it's really uh, of huge importance, uh, like, like the patient consenting. Um, what, what would be, uh, what would be uh, Jack or, or Russia, the, the ideal patient for a CTO indication? 
Rasha, why don't you take that first? I mean, I think from my point of view, before you put them through a high risk procedure, these really are patients you have to assess very thoroughly. So they need to be symptomatic because I think we've, we've all acknowledged that the primary indication is really symptom relief. And I think they really ideally should be symptomatic having had a decent trial of optimal medical therapy. And I think, again, this is one where you're going to have to have seen the patient multiple times, tried a number of antianginals, tried to get them as good as you can possibly get them. And sometimes patients don't want to take that level of tablets. And that may be the point at which you stop, but you should have at least had that discussion. And in my mind, I think the CTO territory really has should be ischemic and at the very least viable. Um, and I think without evidence of those things, you shouldn't really go ahead. And I think the other key point, I suppose, is that this is not something that you should do ad hoc. Um, I think primarily this is something that is you've done a diagnostic angiogram, you've worked the patient up, you've brought them back. You, if you're not, you know, I am not a CTO operator. There are only there are very few CTOs that I choose to tackle myself. The vast majority I either refer to someone else or I do with a CTO operator, you know, standing next to me. So we do them together and I can learn. You know, I don't think I think the days of just have a poke and see what happens are kind of gone. And I think we probably do a lot of damage if we do that. Thank you so much. This brings me to maybe to my, my next question. How many interventions should we have before we, we become autonomous, uh, because, before we become, you know, like uh, independent? What, what do you think, all, all three of you? I think I would like to tackle that first. Uh, at one of when I first started learning CTOs, I was attending courses since because when I did my fellowship, there was no CTO program. Is uh, they said that you could do a thousand regular coronary interventions, but that doesn't mean you can do a CTO. And I have actually learned that uh, myself. It is absolutely true. Uh, Jack had recently written on Twitter that a good CTO operator should be doing about a hundred CTOs a year. And I think that would depend on your referral patterns. And if you're the only center in the area, that would be pretty easy to do. I work in a city of three to 5 million people with 20 cath labs, uh, 20 centers with cath labs. And um, it's uh, very hard to get that volume. So I would like to hear Jack's uh, comments here. How do you ma maintain, get 100 CTOs a year? That's a huge number. I would, uh... I'm going to answer the, the initial question. I, I used to think that you needed 50 CTOs under your belt to be competent, to go out and start doing these all on your own and, and be good. So when I hit 50, I was excited. Then when I hit 100, I thought, no, you really need 100. And then I hit 1,000. I thought, you really need 1,000. And I don't know what my number is now, but I still need more. I learn every day. Every case is a challenge. Some go smoothly, some not so smoothly. I keep getting better every day. So that, that, that number is hard, and I'm not sure that anyone knows the right number. Uh, I, that is tough. Uh, from Walker's point of view or a question, there are a lot of CTOs out there, I and mean, we have in the United States a lot of patients who 20 years ago underwent coronary bypass graft surgery, those grafts have failed. The patients have angina. Some have very mild angina and they're on their beta blocker and maybe a chronic nitrate or calcium channel blocker and they're having minimal symptoms. To Rasha's point, they need to be symptomatic. And I, I would add a caveat, they need to be symptomatic to the point that it is impairing their quality of life. There are some 85-year-old patients who are having some angina daily, but they're doing everything they want to do. They're having breakfast with their wife. They're kissing their wife on the cheek. They're reading the newspaper. They're enjoying life, and a little bit of angina is okay. On the other hand, a 50-year-old gentleman who wants to walk to see his children's uh, soccer game or a football game and is getting angina doing that, that's affecting their quality of life and we need to differentiate that. Uh, there are a lot of CTOs out there. A lot of them are well treated with medical therapy, but a lot of them are still having symptoms and it comes down to the cardiologist seeing them. I don't do CTO PCI, so therefore your angina is not very bad. Or 
just take more nitroglycerin, it's okay. So developing the rapport, developing the trust with the referring doctors, uh, being very honest with the patient, what your expectations are for the procedure, what the risks are for the procedures, uh, and then the patients start coming, um, take good care of the patients, they will take good care of you. Thank you. I would have a question for, uh, um, so I have a question for Russia. What is the percentage of the placebo effect versus no placebo effect? I, I had in mind it was around 2% or I don't know, maybe I... I, oh, I wish it was only that small. <laughs> I think it depends very much on the procedure. Um, and I think for some procedures, obviously, as we discussed, that there are, we deliver much more placebo than others. So you can imagine a scenario, for example, um, where we've had multiple failed CTO attempts at multiple different centers, and then they go and fly across the world to see the expert who's going to do this for them that day. And they meet this fantastic expert in this fancy office, and they've got on a flight to see them you can imagine that some of that adds to the placebo, right? And it's the same, and I often say this to the cardiothoracic colleagues who pretend that there's no placebo to what they do. You can imagine how you feel if you've had your chest cracked open and the best surgeon in the country do this massive operation for you. Again, there is some placebo component, a lot to those kind of procedures. In Orbiter, actually the placebo um, was about 40% of the total effect size. So it was actually far greater than we were expecting. Um, but Again, it depends on the procedure and it depends what you've done. The other thing I think that's important to remember is it's possible that within a clinical trial, there is always more placebo effect because of course you're being very well looked after within a clinical trial. So that's quite different to normal clinical practice. It's hard to quantify, but it's definitely more than 2% in the, in, in the trials that are out there. Thank you. I have one final question for Russia and Jack. And it's to deal with uh, complete revascularization. So when a patient comes in with angina and we fix their culprit, so-called culprit vessels, but then there is a CTO left over. Um, people have no problem dealing with 90%, 80%, even 70% lesions in other vessels. But when it comes to CTO, they say, okay, why don't we see if the patient's symptomatic or not? What are your feelings on that? We don't wait for symptoms for non-CTOs. Why do we wait for CTO yeah. symptoms um, for completeness? Thank you. Well, if that's, I think, a fantastic question. I often say this. There's something about um, what we tackle, what we think is easy, and then we leave the lesion that's probably most likely to be causing their angina. Um, and I mean, maybe I come on to Jack because I'm sure you see this all the time in terms of the referrals you get. You'll see people who've had from some pretty moderate lesions te treated and the most significant lesion left alone just because it was hard to do. Yeah, I, I also see uh, a, a different variation of that. A patient has a large right coronary artery with a CTO they've had for years, but there's a 90% a diagonal or 90% or circumflex lesion that they just blow over and Boy, I, strong. I said, fix all the non-CTO stuff that could be causing this patient's angina, reevaluate them, because uh, I, I think that that just is the way it should be done. Uh, the other question about complete revascularization, read the studies as we all have about complete revascularization having an impact long-term on uh, mortality. I think that is true. But I must say, I am conservative. I will, in the acute setting, want to fix the acute culprit lesions, but I'm more than happy uh, to leave a procedure that is going to take longer, that has significant risk to it. I'm more than happy to wait and see how they uh, do with uh, medical therapy before, before moving on. Thank you. Okay, um, we would like to now close this sash, uh, this uh, webinar. I'd like to thank Alexander for inviting me to put together this uh, program. Russia, Kate, and Jack, thank you for responding and uh, doing an absolutely wonderful presentations, all of you, and thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everyone. You so thank you so much to all of you, and have a nice day and the weekend ahead. Thank you. Yep.